Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship service on this Lord's Day, the fourth Sunday in October. Uh, We'll be following the order of services you find printed in the bulletin or on the screen to the left. Before we begin our opening hymn, I invite you please to greet somebody sitting close to you and particularly someone you don't recognize. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and and merciful Father, Father, I confess confess that that I am am by nature nature sinful sinful, and that I I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I have good news, dear ones. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll continue with the Lord have mercy. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Keep your household, the church, in continual godliness and set us free from all adversities that under your protection we may serve you with true devotion and holy deeds. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our readings. First of our scripture readings for today comes from the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah. And we're reading some of the concluding verses of that chapter of chapter 53 of his prophecy. And here the prophet Isaiah is speaking about the coming Messiah, the suffering that he would endure for the sins of the whole world and the victory that would be his through his resurrection from the dead. Isaiah writes, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 
as far as the words of the prophet Isaiah, we'll sing the refrain in the psalm, Psalm 20 through Psalm 22. Our second scripture reading for today comes from the letter to the Hebrews, and it's these verses from chapter 4 of that letter. Here, uh, the writer invites us to find the Sabbath rest that remains for the people of God, the Sabbath rest that comes through the blessing of the gospel message as it reaches and touches into our hearts and lives. There remains, then, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their, that's the children of Israel's, example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Thus far the words of the writer of the letter to the Hebrews. Alleluia. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Alleluia. rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for this day comes from Mark chapter 10, begins at verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. be seated for our next tip.
bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll find our sermon text uh, for, uh, printed for you on page 11 of the bulletin. We are continuing with our uh, study of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Today is letter number 5, the letter to the church in Sardis. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of, of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. These are God's words. Dear friends in Christ, like so many other of these uh, churches that uh, Jesus writes to in Revelation 2 and 3, we really don't know much of anything about this congregation either, when it was founded and so forth. But we, we think that by the time of this letter, it had been around for a little while, like the other ones too. Uh, maybe by this time... You know, maybe like third generation Christians, fourth generation Christians, something like that maybe. Which is interesting because that fits us real well, doesn't it? We're third generation, fourth generation Christians here at St. Mark's as well. So it's kind of neat to have a letter like this that where we can maybe dig into it even a little further and see and uh, in the blessing of the Holy Spirit, let it speak to us too as we pray it did to the people there uh, in the days of Sardis. So I'd like to use as our theme for today, you can't live on your reputation. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the letter like we kind of do each time. I want to look first of all at the description of the Lord Jesus here, and then we'll actually look at the body of the letter, and then we'll look at the promise that, uh, that Jesus extends uh, at the end of the letter. So Jesus begins uh, by describing himself this way. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now this term, the seven spirits of God, this is the first time we've heard that term in our study. It's not the first time it's been used in the book of Revelation. It was used right in the very beginning, right in the introduction, where John was talking about the seven spirits of God. It's a reference, it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. If you're an Old Testament student, you'll bump into this term rarely, but once in a while, particularly in the prophet Isaiah. He likes to talk about the sevenfold spirit and so forth. What you have here in the picture that Jesus is giving you here as he holds the seven spirits of God is this incredible, beautiful, intimate connection that exists between the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It's why you and I will say in a few minutes in the Nicene Creed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. There's just this beautiful connection. The three of them just have this marvelous, marvelous intimate connection with one another. And Jesus symbolizes it here by saying, I hold the seven spirits of God. But what's really cool, folks, 
is he says, I also hold the seven stars. Now that term we have met before. Jesus has used that. He's explained it even. Says the seven stars, when that term is used, it's referring to the seven angels of the seven churches. You and I have looked at this term. When we look at that term angel, you need to understand it literally means messenger. And in today's language, we'd call it pastors and teachers. Isn't that just the coolest picture? I hope it is for you, leastways. Because you've got to understand, folks, you and I are submitting ourselves, aren't we? To pastors and teachers. We're opening ourselves up to them and we are praying that, they, that God guides them and us into a deeper knowledge of who He is and what He has done for us in Jesus and what He desires for you and me to do. Not just, in, uh, not just submitting ourselves to those pastors and teachers either, are we? Submitting our kids to, to those pastors and teachers. It's got to be a comfort, I hope and pray it is, for you. To hear Jesus describe these seven messengers of these seven churches, which is just inclusive of all of Jesus' messengers for all time, being held right in the palm of his hand. That is a promise of blessing for those who have been called to shepherd us and our children. And it is also a call, it is also a promise to hold these people accountable on the last day. This is the one who's writing this letter to the congregation in Sardis. So, let's look at that. So, right away he begins again by saying, I know. And you and I have looked at that term enough. You and I know that this means that we just read about the, the Word of God being sharper than any double-edged sword. And it, it judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's this I know. Jesus knows, and he knows his congregation at Sardis. And he says... You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. And then a little further on, we'll talk about this uh, phrase here in just a second. He says, I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. So let's kind of put those two together and talk about them for just a second. So I think we can assume that God in his grace and blessing uh, poured out the Holy Spirit on these people. Uh, as he brought them together initially, way back in the beginning of the congregation's existence. If you've been connected at all with the mission congregation, you kind of know the routine. You know, it's just maybe you come to some place that you have to rent for Sunday morning. You might have to sweep it first, and set up some chairs, and get some kind of a makeshift altar, but it's all just really cool because we're enjoying people. We've got folks who are there with us working and setting this stuff up. And it's just kind of a neat deal. A fellowship is a neat thing. And we have come together to worship our God. Lots of times if you go to a mission congregation, singing is really good. Because the folks are just happy to be there and happy to praise their God. They're eager to hear God's Word being shared to them, strengthen them for the tasks they may have traveled. Some of them travel a long ways to come to church on a Sunday morning. And you can kind of picture this in Sardis, can't you? You know, they're serving their Lord at their, at their very best with the energy that God's given them and the offerings that they bring to our Lord to serve. And above all, dear ones, they're looking forward to every opportunity to reach out with the gospel to their friends and neighbors. Maybe they get something going and have some kind of a shindig you know, over in the church parking lot, and you know, cook up some brats and dogs and something, just invite people over and welcome them into the neighborhood or whatever. Can't you kind of see that going? I expect that's, you know, the stuff that happened. That first generation, excited folks. Second generation comes along. Third generation comes along. Maybe the fourth by this time. We don't know how long uh, since the congregation had been founded. But stuff has changed. Well, I mean, not, not the message, not the, the church service. I mean, the church service may have just mushroomed 
I mean, you may have had to do, deal initially with somebody plunking out a note or two on a piano. And now you got folks up that can play this massive organ. you got an orchestra there, some kind of a band. I mean, music is off the charts and all this kind of thing. And, and I mean, the stuff is there, but in here, it's not the same. And that second generation, that third generation, bearing the rich blessings from all the work, the hard work of that first generation. But they're not, they're not working. They're, you know, can I use the term? They're going through the motions. They're going through the motions. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, I find your deeds unfinished. That's not the best translation. That's the newest NIV. The 84 NIV is better. Jesus says, I've not found your deeds complete. It's getting closer. The word literally means full. You know what Jesus is saying? I find your deeds empty. Not the size, not the number, the motivation. And for this congregation, Jesus says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Harsh word from the Lord Jesus, no mistake. But remember, dear ones, that this is the Lord of the church. This is the one who shed his blood. This isn't just some authority guy coming in with no knowledge of what's going on. He knows exactly what's going on. His love for this congregation is unbounded. And so he gives this wonderful, wonderful invitation to them. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. And go on a little bit further. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. Dear ones, there's, there's only one thing. So, I mean, we can give this a lot of different names. I call it uh, going through the motions. You can call it apathy or complacency. You know, there's a lot of... You could even call it hypocrisy, really, um, which is a harsh word. But we could call it that. Oh, all this stuff, you know, it's, we're talking pretty much about the same thing. And there's only one way to deal with it. In there. There's only one thing that you can do with this thing. Oh, first of all, we should say, <laughs> you know, it isn't that there are some who are apathetic and others who are not apathetic, right? You get that all right, right? It's not that some are and some aren't. We're all apathetic. We're all complacent. It's part of our sinful nature, folks. It's that thing that wants you to check out the other side of the pillow in the morning. Instead of getting up on time, right? Or whatever the case. I mean, it just goes on and on and on with the list of ways that our sinful flesh tries to keep us from doing the things that we know that we should be doing, like this, being here in church. And there's only one way to deal with it. There are times when the Bible uses some incredibly vivid pictures and St. Paul is one of those people. And one of those times he talked about you and me dealing with our sinful flesh the only way that we can. And he said you need to crucify it. You need to crucify it. Now I know coddle also begins with a C, but we're talking two different things. The problem is my sinful flesh wants me to coddle it. Scold it if you want. Yeah, that's okay. But the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, wants for you and me to deal with our sinful flesh the only way that we can, which is to crucify it. It's why we continue to offer uh, confession of sins at the beginning of the service. So that we have an opportunity, but also a reminder. This is what needs to happen with my sinful flesh every day. Luther called it drowning the old Adam by daily contrition and repentance. And then to understand once again that this incredible God who is extending this invitation to us to wake up 
has also shed his blood that you and I might have a cleansing that is absolutely without compare. There's no soap that'll get you as clean as the blood of Jesus. And it washes us so completely clean, the Bible actually calls us it's just as if we didn't sin. That's what it means to be justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. And in the strength and blessing of the Holy Spirit, then to do what Jesus says here, remember what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. Now there's a reason, dear ones, why this business of complacency is, is something more than just, well, yeah, we all do it, you know, kind of a thing and you kind of blow it off. And that's what Jesus says at the end of his warning to these people. He says, if you don't repent, if you don't deal with this sin, I will come at you at a time that you do not know. Okay, nobody knows when Jesus is coming again, right? That's, and that's what he's talking about. Jesus isn't talking about coming to us like he's going to come to us in the sacrament of Holy Communion or coming to us through his word. He's talking about coming again in judgment. And nobody knows when that day or hour is. He's not talking about you becoming wise enough to know the date and the time that he's coming. The invitation, dear ones, is to be prepared simply because you don't know when he's coming again. And now hopefully you begin to see the urgency of the whole business. Because you might recall that parable that Jesus told of ten virgins that were, being, that were getting ready for a wedding procession into the banquet. Five were wise, five were foolish. And you might remember what happened with those who were foolish. May it never happen to any of us. Jesus concludes his letter as he typically does with a beautiful promise. He talks first of all about those there are a few, he says, in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Which is an interesting term that he uses here. Because he's referring to the apathy. He's referring to having a reputation of being alive, but you're really dead. There were some who hadn't. In the blessing of the Holy Spirit, they had continued and with a humble and penitent heart to come before their God to seek His cleansing and His renewing, and in that strength, going forth and continuing to live for Him. Jesus says, you will be dressed in white. That white robe of righteousness that is the only thing to wear at the wedding banquet in heaven. Nobody else gets in. Just the person who has that white robe. And Jesus says, to the one who's victorious, to the one who overcomes, I'll give that white robe to everyone. Their names, Jesus says, will not be taken out of the book of life where your name is written, dear ones, by God's grace. And Jesus says, I will stand for them in the mansions of heaven. The Son of God Himself who holds the seven spirits of God will testify for you and for me that we belong there, that we have a right to be there in the mansions of heaven, that we are welcome forever and ever. Once again, Jesus closes the letter with, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You and I sometimes conclude the uh, sermon portion of the service with a beautiful prayer from Psalm 51, a psalm of David. And I'd like to do that with you now. I'll say the words you think it through with me. It's very familiar. This needs to be our prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation 
and uphold me with thy free spirit. God grant it. Amen. Would you please stand? May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, we referred to it before. If you would please now join with me. You'll see the, one of the ancient creeds of the Christian church uh, posted for you there on the screen. Please join me. We'll use the words of the Nicene Creed as our confession of faith today. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you may be seated. Once again, I want to extend a welcome to all of you who are here with us this day and a welcome also to those who may be watching us today online. We ask you all, both those who are online and those who are, who are here today, if you'd sign the friendship register that you'll find here in church uh, in the, by the center aisle in each pew and uh, give us a record of your attendance today. Thank you very much. And those of you who are online, if you would also do the same thing. There are also different ways uh, for those of you who are not here in church there are different ways uh, that are mentioned on our um, online site, um, ways that you can contribute to the support of St. Mark's Lutheran Church. Thank you. Please arise. When I surveyed the wondrous cross on which a prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a tribute far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, 
demands my soul, my life, my all. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this hour of worship and the privilege of meeting you through your word and sacrament this day. We thank you for the blessing of your good spirit and the invitation, O Lord, to come to you and find rest. We pray and trust, O Lord, that you will grant us the refreshing that comes from your gospel message, that we might be strengthened to live for you and to serve you each day. We lift up to you, O oh Lord, the many concerns around our world, across our country, throughout the Christian church here on earth, and in our own personal lives, and our congregation here at St. Mark's. You know all of our needs, O oh Lord, as you have known all of the deeds and the needs of the congregations uh, in Revelation 2 and 3. We lay these needs before you, O oh Lord and trust that you will supply all of these needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we'll continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give praise, and praise. praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ, the same night on which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise and we'll join in singing, Thank the Lord. people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. Receive now our Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. be seated for the closing hymn. again thank you so much for joining us today if you are visiting with us here at st mark's today we ask you please uh, there's a guest book out in the entryway and we invite you please to sign that before um before you leave today and please join us again uh, there's just a couple of things that are not in the announcements for this week uh, risen savior is having a forensics night this thursday but i don't have a start time help six Somewhere in there. And <laughs> thanks, Meredith. Do we meet in here? Uh, details are still being worked out. Details being worked out. Folks, you'll hear about it. But uh, those of you who don't hear about it, come at 6 o'clock. Come on over here, and we'll point you in the right direction. Uh, we have a couple of letters that I need to read for you. Uh, first of all, uh, we have an acknowledgment letter from uh, the man that we extended the call to principal, as principal for uh, Risen Savior. Lutheran School. His name is Jacob Steinmetz, and we won't hold it against him, but he comes from Appleton, Wisconsin. <laughs> and he says this, Dear families of Risen Savior Lutheran School and members of St. Mark's and St. Paul's Lutheran Churches, 
Several days ago, I was extended a divine call to serve as Risen Savior's principal and 7th and 8th grade teacher. I'm humbled by your call to serve. In the coming days and weeks, I will be considering the opportunities the Lord has placed before me to serve his kingdom. I look forward to learning more about the ministry of Risen Savior as I deliberate. I would humbly ask that you keep me and my family in your prayers as I prayerfully consider the calls the Lord has placed before me, both to Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran School and Risen Savior Lutheran School. In Christ's love, Jacob Steinmetz. Uh, so that call was extended a couple of weeks ago today on October the 10th. So if you would please keep um, Mr. Steinmetz in your prayers. I know he would appreciate it uh, very, very much being lifted up in prayer on behalf of Risen Savior and also uh, the school he is currently serving, Shepherd of the Valley. I have a, another letter that uh, is a copy of a letter that was that Miss Meredith Milbrath sent to Man uh, Mankato, Manitowoc Lutheran High School. Dear members of St. Mark and St. Paul's Lutheran Churches, I would like to share that last Saturday I received the divine call from Manitowoc Lutheran High School to instruct grade school band, be leadership in the drama department, and serve in the music department as my God-given gifts allow. I'm truly blessed that the Lord has given me the opportunity to prayerfully consider serving him in a new ministry at MLHS or continue my ministry at Risen Savior, knowing the Lord will be honored and glorified in either place. I ask that you keep me in your prayers as I prayerfully deliberate both calls the Lord has placed before me. I pray for the Lord's guidance as I reflect and trust he will lead and bless me in my decision. I ask that you also pray the Lord will continue to bless the ministries at both Manitowoc Lutheran High School and Risen Savior. Also, please share with me any questions or thoughts you have as I deliberate. I'm confident that the Lord will direct me to where I can best use my talents to serve him and his people. To God be the glory. Your servant in Christ, Meredith Milbrath. So uh, what I said for uh, Mr. Steinmetz, uh, we also please lift up Meredith in your prayers as she considers where the Lord would have her serve him. I have just one last thing. We have with us today Chuck Clammer from our sister congregation, St. Paul's in North Mankato, and he'd like to speak to us for a few minutes about Feed My Lambs. You want this? Ooh. I'm real loud. Okay. When you're hard of hearing, it's really easy to talk loud. That way you hear yourself. If you're in a bathtub or in the shower, sing it, take them out. You don't have to listen to yourself. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to give you a quick update. It's on. It's on. Thank you very much. I won't talk so loud. Okay. Anyway, to give you an update on, on Feed My Lamb and where we are today, um, Feed My Lamb, as you know, is the capital funding portion of Risen Savior Lutheran School. So we collect money in many different ways. Many people give us weekly or monthly or quarterly donations. Some give us memorials. Some just give us cash at different times. I recently had a guy, I went and picked up some stuff from his house, some steel, loaded it in the car and he gave me a check for an appliance. We get paid $15 for your appliance and basically what happens is those, I take them apart, pull the wiring out of them, and then the rest goes into scrap for steel. And then he said, you're such a nice guy. <clears throat> no, not really. No. <laughs> but anyway, he said, let's have a beer and then he gave me a tip of $100 for the school. Well, I thought that's pretty cool. So anyway, that's pretty cool. So, And uh, so th through the years, we do different events. And uh, one of the events we had is a golf outing. And Paul leads that up and some other people. And, and uh, they generated about $12,000. I think there was a, a note in the bulletin. That $12,000, we looked at the amount of money we had in the savings or the checking account. We felt we had sufficient to make our monthly payments. So that 12000 went right against the principal. So the way the checking account works, our payments are $2,000 a month. And uh, so we try to keep enough money there so we don't run out of money because we have to make the payments. And if we have extra money, we apply it towards the principal. Our loan is a declining balance note, which means every time we pay something against the principal, drops the principal, and then we have less money going towards the interest. 
And I think right now our loan is about 175,000. Remember, right? You can correct me if I'm wrong. And what happened, to Galen? Okay. <laughs> he just, oh, he's back there. Okay. So I just noticed he's gone. Okay. And uh, I don't remember where I was in the conversation anyway. But anyway, uh, I think of that $2,000 right now, about uh, $600 goes to principal or goes to interest, and $1,400 goes to principal. So we're working every time we can get that pushed down, we get less money going to interest and more paying off to school. So I just want to give you a quick uh, update on scrap for cash. And I'll try to do this by memory, and if I don't do it by memory very good, I'll pull out my notes. But anyway, scrap for cash, you see these trailers sitting out here. Somebody says, like, whatever happens to all that stuff? I take it back to the farm, and we separate the different metals by grade and what they are. So basically, we have, we have steel, which is prepared unprepared and stainless steel. Then we have the yellow metals, which is brass, copper, various forms of copper, copper plumbing, copper wiring, copper, there's different types of wire windings off motors. And then we have aluminum, that's aluminum cans, it takes a lot of those to make any money, but we do it. And then there's aluminum siding, cast aluminum, breakage and different things like that. So this past year we took in about $6,200 in scrap haulings in. And uh, of that, 2,600, 26,000 pounds of steel. I think 800 pounds, I can look at my note quick. Don't drop the mic. We'll believe whatever you say from college. We'll whatever you say, yeah. So <laughs> Eight hundred pounds of stainless steel, 1,840 pounds of yellow metals, that's cap, copper, brass, and 1,900 pounds of aluminum. So what happens to all this stuff? It gets there, you know, we haul it home here, and uh, sometimes it's not a real good conversation between me and my wife because <laughs> keep, keep bringing trailer loads of stuff out to my yard. So we drive down the driveway, and she says, well, your friends from Piedmont Lab have been here again. Can't hardly get around the truck. There's just junk laying all over the place. So I kind of watch the price of metals, and if they're up, I'll try to sell them. If they're not up, I'll just stack them out in the pasture. And then she rides the ATV around the pasture and sees this big pile of junk there. And she reminds me over breakfast that you don't have a junkyard permit. And I'm kind of eating my toast and thinking about it, and then usually if it comes out of my mouth, not very wise, you got a lot of weeds in your flower bed too. So <laughs> the next day we go. Next day we go to Hardy's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, we do appreciate all the stuff you people bring out there, and so it's it's going fairly well. And then you know what a windfall is. If you've ever been around an apple tree, a windfall is something just hits you in the head, you know. You pick it up and say, hmm, where'd that come from? Well, we normally been doing some challenge grants or gifts at the end of the year. A friend of mine called me and said, you know, I just had a windfall. And I said, I know what that is. And he said, I got a check for 12, just about $12,000. And I'd like to donate that to Risen Savior, feed my lamb. And, the, and what I want you to do is have it all applied towards the principal. So I said, we can do that. So next week, you'll probably get a bolted insert. We'll give you the details of that. So the money that's collected for Feed My Lamb during the month of November and December will go towards that principal reduction. So you'll be getting some, so whatever you put in towards it, good. And uh, somehow the Lord always seems to bless us and we usually match it. So I'm just very happy to be here and talk to you and thanks for all of your help. And I know you have a donation right now, you said, until the <coughs> middle of November. Yeah, oh, you're going to, okay, in the yeah, alley? The okay, so, are you going to talk about that, Galen? Nope? Okay. I thought, man, that's why you had it back there. Okay. <laughs> going to be the backup guy, so asking for money, so.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to just say, say one thing before we leave. Uh, you know, Pastor, after the service, welcomes all of our people that are here, and especially our visitors. But I think we also have a special welcome for two people today that are here with us. And it's people that haven't been able to be with us for some time. We prayed for them in our services because they've had significant health challenges recently. And that's our brothers in the faith. John Schwertfeger here, 